since uh, this and the next session I'll be talking about is dedicated to Dr. Basu, I'd like to open with a few remarks about him. He's one of, uh, most of uh, the statisticians here know him for Basu's theorem on complete sufficient statistics, minimum variance and so forth. But he's also India's, one of the first Bayesians. And if I'm a Bayesian, it's because of a profound influence that he had on me. Uh, uh, he didn't come to, uh, he didn't come to the Bayesian paradigm through roots like rationality, actions, coherence and so on. He came from being a frequentist and that's a route that many of us have taken like uh, me, Jim Barger, certainly Basu himself. And uh, in a series of selected articles which uh, he helped me arrange, you can see his quest from questions about foundations to finally a Bayesian position. And uh, you might still like to read that and see how you got there. Paradoxes and so on. Uh, in the summing up, he says, he has the Indian view. In the Indian view, you cannot describe reality through positive attributes. You say it's not these, it's not these. It's a list of negatives. <laughs> so, he, so his way of saying I'm a Bayesian is to say, this is wrong with frequencies, this is wrong with frequencies, and so on and so forth. Lots and lots of counterexamples. And to the extent that you cannot find a counterexample, a telling counterexample against the Bayesian paradigm, is a measure of support for the Bayesian paradigm. <clears throat> so, uh, uh, well, uh, he's uh, a victim of Alzheimer. So, so I was sort of stunned when I saw him recently. Such a fine intellect, no longer, uh, no longer in control of it. Okay, so let's uh, uh, begin. Uh, What I'm going to talk about is based on joint research with a graduate student at Purdue, Nitya Mukhopadhyay. Almost all of it is joint work with him. And some of it is joint work with Jim Barger. <laughs> Jim does not yet approve of all things that we've done, so we don't know which one he'll associate with. <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, he's going to talk about overview and new results. Uh, and. Uh, since I have two lectures, I'll try to go slowly, but still stop me if you want to. Uh, what are the strategies? There are four, maybe three or four main strategies. One is uh, what's called the Bayesian information criterion based on Bayes factors. Then uh, there's a frequentist, somehow it's regarded as a frequentist. Uh, the key information criterion, AIC. Then there's an entirely different method based on the computer science ideas based on Kolmogorov's algorithmic complexity. I sort of focus today only on the first two, but I'll say a couple of words about the third two. But before I do that, why uh, I would like to answer a question, why has model selection become very important today? Model selection has been used in time series for a long time, especially the AIC and its many derivatives, which are small perturbations of AIC. But, uh, <clears throat> but it's now come to the mainstream. It's come to the mainstream for several reasons. One is that uh, the logistic linear models have become very popular. Uh, and the logistic linear models are based on asymptotic theory. Maximum likelihood estimates, it's asymptotics, likelihood ratio tests, asymptotics of that. And people have known for a long time, not just Bayesians, frequentists also, that uh, the classical testing is in very bad shape, especially for large samples. For large samples, even frequentists have pointed out that these conventional values of alpha are quite wrong. They lead to absurdities. But on the other hand, they have not come up with alternative conventional values. Model selections are a way of coming up, you can think of them as coming up with conventional alphas. At least in one example, I'll try to indicate this. So, <clears throat> so that's one case. It's also being used widely in data mining. Jim Barger tells me that uh, some of the most successful data miners are users of some sort of model selection. Thirdly, it's been used in data compression. You know, this uh, big industry where uh, you compress data for, uh, for transmission through TV channels and so on. There, uh, there's a famous threshold rule due to two statisticians, Donahue and Johnston, based on wavelets 
that can be thought of as a model selection rule. And there have been new contenders. Uh, for example, uh, I've had Aid George claim that he has a rule, it's a, again a model selection rule, which does better in all the cases that he has tried than the usually accepted uh, Donohue Johnston rule. So there are all these many reasons why model selection has become very popular. Simultaneously, there's a lot of confusion about these. And I might be um, able to indicate some of these, but not all. For example, uh, <coughs> Bayesians seem to be allergic to Akaiki. If you, if you read Bayesian literature, you either see no mention or uh, complete indifference. On the other hand, when you go to Akaiki's Institute, Institute of Statistical Mathematics, they openly claim that theirs is the best. That cannot be, we know, we know it cannot be like that. And one of the objects of today's talk would be to show that uh, AIC has indeed a place in the Bayesian paradigm. You can, uh, it has a Bayes, Bayesian motivation, very strong Bayesian motivation. Uh, how did I get involved into these? Uh, I got involved into these very recently. But I, I've been on the sidelines watching what's going on for a long time for certain <laughs> accidental reasons. Uh, when I joined the ISI in 66, uh, almost within six months, I had to explain to Professor Mahalnabis the notion of algorithmic complexity of Kolmogorov because one of Kolmogorov's seminal papers had appeared in Shankar, 1963 or 65. It's still a classic paper, everybody refers to that. And uh, later, uh, I was associated with the publication of Schwer's BIC. I happened to be the associate editor handling that paper for the Annals of Mathematical Statistics. And it's, it sort of throws some light on the way that we decide about papers and how wrong we can be. Uh, this was a paper. Uh, the Annals has a rule that uh, at least two people have to agree that it's a good paper. Uh, if there's a tie, then it's rejected. Uh, in the case of uh, this paper, uh, this, was, uh, this appeared in 78, so I'm talking of something around 76 or so. Uh, the referee said it's a trivial paper, should not be published. Uh, I said uh, it's mathematically not demanding, but uh, I can see it has great potential, and it ought to. The editor took the view that the analyst policy should be upheld and rejected. But Schwarz is a survivor. He fought against that and got it published. <coughs> But uh, these, this confusion about these two criteria sort of date back from Schwarz's paper. Schwarz begins by saying that uh, Akaiki's AIC had appeared a few years ago, maybe 73, 74. And uh, he begins by saying that uh, it has no sense. It's not possible. Here is what you should do. And when I recommended the publication of this paper, I said, uh, I, I could even then I could see that he was not right, that they were working in different paradigms or different frameworks. So I said this at least should be taken out. It's not fair to uh, to to uh, Akaiki. The referee said that Schwarz's paper was a trivial comment on an obscure paper in an obscure journal. So so, so these are the things that we've been saying about a paper which has now turned out to be of seminal importance to Bayesians. Uh, but uh, when the paper was published. Uh, Schwarz managed to give even th those, uh, those uh, sort of uh, 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 asides against Akaiki. And that has gone on, uh, sort of these two camps on two. Uh, since I'm not going to talk about Kolmogorov complexity and I have a little time, so I'll just quickly sh give you some references. Uh, and maybe I'll tell you a little about what they do because. Uh, uh, <coughs> uh, there's, a, there's a book uh, by Spring, written by two computer scientists, 1997, all about Kolmogorov complexity. It's actually uh, that common name, but it's due to uh, two Americans also, Kolmogorov, Sh Sh and uh, Solomonier for some, some, somebody. But it seems that they independently came to the same notion. And the idea is interesting. Uh, Kolmogorov was trying to sort of describe how, by looking at a finite string of zeros and ones, you can tell whether it's random or not. So it's not an infinite sequence. You don't have any of the tastes. 
You have just a finite sequence of zeros and ones. And how can you tell whether it's random or not? And he said, if it takes, uh, how you have to describe this. Uh, for example, suppose it's 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, periodic. Then you simply write down a program saying 0, 1, repeat, repeat this. But if it's really random, you have to write a long program to reproduce that, uh, reproduce that binary string. So the length of the program in some universal language is the complexity of re reproducing this message. And that's a measure of how random it is. When, the, when you want to do model selections, what they say is you must write down the model in the, pro in the form of a program. And then there must be a program to reproduce the data from the model. And you have to take into account this total complexity in arriving at a model selection rule. They do this in a formal way, which is indeed one a Bayesian way of doing these. It's like a Bayesian way of doing this with not the common loss functions. Uh, if you want to know more about this, there's uh, somebody who's written uh, papers which are transparent to statisticians, Rizanen. He's done something of this kind, not quite what computer scientists do, but some loss function like this with a formal base rule, it turns out that that least it starts from a different point but it leads to the same rule as BIC. Uh, so that's the kind of thing. Uh, OK, so uh, I'll just skip that. Now get back to what I was talking about. <clears throat> Here's a toy example that uh, anyone can follow through for himself, whatever I'm saying today. <coughs> uh, uh, to Bayesians, there's no difference between model selection and testing problems. It's not quite the same for frequentists, for whom the null hypothesis plays a special role. The errors or loss functions are asymmetric. So uh, apart from that, there's not much of a difference. So here is a, think of this testing problem. There's a normal unknown mean with a known standard deviation of 1. And uh, we have one hypothesis or a model, mu equal to 0, against, uh, uh, against the alternative that mu could be arbitrary. Or you might write, say, mu is not equal to 0. I'm not going to sort of distinguish between these two cases. In fact, typically in model selection descriptions, we follow the version that I've kept, that uh, mu belongs to R. So mu equal to 0 is also allowed. So it's, these are what are called nested models. Uh, mu equal to 0 is nested within the bigger model. Uh, we might add sigma square also, but that's just an unnecessary complication. It's not going to add to insight. So what would a Bayesian do in such cases? What I'm going to do is to try to motivate the BIC first and then turn to AIC. The BIC is very easy to motivate. <clears throat> so think of a 0, 1 loss, testing problems associated with a 0, 1 loss. Uh, and uh, what a Bayesian would do is to put prior probabilities on these two models, M1 and M2. But uh, under M2, there's also this unknown parameter mu. So you have to give, give a conditional distribution. That's this. Uh, pi mu uh, m2, pi mu m2 is the conditional distribution of mu, given that the second model is true. Once you have these, uh, it's very easy to calculate uh, the posterior probability. So all, all the uncertainty has been quantified. You know the probabilities for each model, and you know the probability distribution for mu given uh, this model m2. So you can calculate the posterior probability that M1 is true or posterior probability that M2 is true. And then you choose the one with a higher posterior probability. That's the Bayes rule. Uh, usually, in these problems, one takes uh, pi 1 equal to pi 2 equal to half. So both models get equal weight. Uh, so both mu equal to 0 and mu belongs to R and getting probability half. Now, in this case, looking at the posterior probability is uh, 
equivalent to looking at what's called the Bayes factor, which is uh, the density, the density of uh, the whole data x1 to xn under m1, and uh, under m2 there's this unknown mu, so you have to integrate out mu. That's the density under m2. So these two, these two creatures. Uh, and that ratio uh, can be used for model selection in this way. It's less intuitive than posterior probabilities, but uh, convenient to work with for, very, for various reasons. So Bayesians often use these rather than posterior probabilities. So posterior probability of uh, model 1 is bigger than half if this is bigger than 1, and so on. What Schwartz pointed out was that uh, if uh, the conditional distribution of mu give, so so the base factor still depends on the the uh, conditional distribution of mu given m2. Uh, Schwartz was not a Bayesian; he was merely using Bayesian ideas. So he didn't like this dependence of the base factor on pi, but he pointed out that if pi had nice properties, was smooth, and so on then there's an approximation to the base factor which does not depend on pi. It's sort of free. For all pi, you get the same approximation. So, and that ought to be good because it's an approximation for all pi. And that's the BIC. So you start with the posterior probability. Then you take pi 1 equal to pi 2 equal to half. So you move to the base factor. And then you try to approximate the base factor in a way that would free the base factor from dependence on the prior. And that leads you to the BIC. What do we get in this case, in this toy example? OK, so here's a comment on Schwarz. Schwarz had done this for exponential families. Uh, and the proof that he had used, Schwarz was working in those days on sequential analysis. And uh, very interesting work on sequential analysis. And this was a fallout from those. But that proof cannot be, cannot be extended to all the examples that we have today. Uh, and so people don't do it in that way anymore. <coughs> uh, I'll, I'll show you how it is proved. Uh, all Bayesians uh, know how to prove this. And uh, what I have here are some conditions under which that approximation holds. The, the conditions under which Schwartz is approximation holes do not require exponential distribution, but they do require the Tamarau type regularity conditions, you know, those local differentiability and so on, it interchange and so forth, whatever. And also a global condition. I will not elaborate on this, but uh, one also needs a global condition. Uh, whenever Bayesians do asymptotics, they do need some global conditions, and you know, have to use these. So <coughs> I'll show you for this toy example uh, what was going to happen. Uh, unfortunately, I, I haven't, uh, it's a bit, um, let me see if I can, uh, OK. So I'm looking at the log denominator of the base factor. Remember, the numerator of the base factor was a simple uh, density, we, we didn't, it's just a product of normal densities, there's mu equal to zero, so no problem. So the only place where we have to approximate is here in the denominator, where we integrate out mu. Now this is done by what Bayesians call Laplace integration, based on Laplace's principle. Uh, we have a probabilist here in the audience, so he knows what Laplace integration means, it's sort of basic in large deviations too. <coughs> Uh, it, it simply means that uh, when you evaluate an integral, you, you sort of concentrate on where the maximum is attained. Look at the integral, maximize that. If the maximum is sharp, it's a sharp peak, then most of the contributions to the integral come from the neighborhood of the peak. And that's what leads to simple approximations. Uh, so what's done here is something that we do again and again for likelihood analysis. We expand the log fx1 to extend mu around mu hat. So that's the first term. That's the first term of the expansion of log fx1 to extend mu. And uh, <coughs> uh, uh, it's within an integral, so everything else is here. 
That's the integral which I switch to pi. Now, this uh, maximum does not involve mu, so I've taken this out of the integral, and then out of this log, it's this log. So what you really have, the integral that you saw in the denominator is this times this quantity. So what's uh, A? A is the second, N A is the second derivative of the log likelihood that mu hat. Then you have the second term that you get in expansions of log likelihood, mu minus mu hat squared. That looks almost like a normal, uh, but the expansion is valid only in the neighborhood of mu. But uh, this Laplace principle says that you need not integrate over all of R, but only in a neighborhood of mu hat. And if you do in a neighborhood of mu hat, you can, uh, you can use uh, standard normal integral formulas, and you get this sort of thing. Uh, that integral is, uh, would be like root over this. Can I move? Let, let's see. So this integral, this integral would be root over twice pi divided by root n times a. And root n times a, that what? 1 over root n times a is here, and root over twice pi is here. Then uh, in a neighborhood, this is nearly a constant. So this would be pi mu hat. That's in this O1. And that a that comes with n, that comes here. So the only place where you have a pi is here. What, uh, what Schwarz did was to club together all these terms. They're all constants, and keep only the term that I outside within the parenthesis. So <clears throat> that's the BIC. So what you get then, uh, the BIC is this first term minus half log n. So the maximized log maximum likely used minus half log n and it's called, and you ignore whatever else you see on the board, on, on the screen. So it's called the penalized log likelihood. Why must we penalize the log likelihood? Uh, we appeal to the principle that scientists call parsimony. If you have extra parameters, you must penalize. Otherwise, you'll always choose the most complex model. So that's coming in very naturally. So we did not put in it uh, explicitly. It's coming from a natural Bayesian root. So here's more about the BIC. Uh, so minus half log n is the penalty term. And I've already told you that it penalizes a complex model. If it were p parameters, you could go through the same kind of argument, expand, but now there would be a p-variate, multivariate normal, which you have to integrate, and that's going to contribute minus p by 2 log n. So this is the co half log n is the coefficient, and p uh, is the dimension of the model. <coughs> uh, I, I said that this is a conventional, it fixes a conventional alpha. So what are you looking at? Uh, when you look at the taste says BF, the base factor is greater than 1, you're saying that the maximized log likelihood is bigger or smaller than minus half log n. That's the cutoff point. So that sets the conventional alpha. <coughs> uh, this is just a sort of aside that uh, in these problems, if I had kept the constant terms and used the Jeffries prior, uh, I would sort of cover all the constant terms. It would be correct up to little of one. So if, I, if pi had been the Jeffries prior, you've been hearing about the Jeffries prior quite a bit, I'm sure. Then, uh, th then uh, uh, you get a better approximation. Uh, one of the uh, I'm not going to talk about today, but one of the major developments in the last few years has been focused on the constant term. Uh, what would be uh, a natural way of choosing pi and fixing that constant term? If n is not too large, then the constant term is indeed important for decision making. And most of this work has been done by uh, Jim Barger and his students, and uh, Anthony O'Hagan, Barger, Perici, O'Hagan, and others. But this is not the place to talk about that. So if we had k models, I, I began with the toy example where we had only two models. But generally, we might have k models, m1, m2, mk. I'm still assuming they are nested. 
Uh, today I'll only be talking about nested cases. <coughs> uh, then the base information criterion looks like this. So for each model MI, you maximize with respect to the corresponding parameter, and then you penalize through this term. And you choose the model for which this whole quantity is the biggest. Choose that model M, M for which this penalized log likelihood is maximum. So as you can see, it makes good sense and is easy to communicate. On the other hand, the AIC, the Akaiki information criterion, is very hard to communicate. I mean, at least uh, that's the way that it appears to me. I've made many attempts to uh, sort of understand what Akaiki had wrote. He has three papers, not all of them in obscure journals. One of them was in uh, the Tokyo Annals of Statistics. <coughs> but uh, they're all very hard to understand. Uh, it's not clear what kind of asymptotics is doing, what his conditions are. So sometimes you say his P is going to infinity, but when he does his computation, that's not so. I've even read uh, his contribution uh, and his introduction to that in the breakthroughs. You know, there are three, two or three volumes of breakthroughs in statistics, and AIC is listed there. And uh, it's introduced by D. Lee Lowe's. But that's also very obscure. I mean, I, I don't understand. Uh, I've understood the reason that I got involved in this is that I read recently a paper by Jun Shao, and that has made transparent why Akaiki. Uh, is works so well in many cases. I'll tell you about that as part of the overview detail, but not now. I'll first tell you what Akaiki does. It again uh, provides some kind of automatic penalized log likelihood rule. One of the advantages that most people don't want to think for themselves. They want conventional rules. Uh, so. Uh, the base rule has led to one conventional rule, and we'll look later at how Akai Akaiki got this. Uh, here's another uh, penalty. This time the penalty is just uh, minus the dimension of theta, so minus p. Many of you who know uh, the, this criterion would, would have known that it comes with a 2. It comes with a 2 because in those cases, th this is also multiplied by 2. So it's just a matter of rescaling. If you multiply this by two scale uh, two, uh, two, then I think it becomes a chi square. So that's an advantage to statisticians. So they have this with a two. Uh, I've already told you what's up there that uh, I find it very hard to understand Akaiki's own justifications. Which doesn't mean that he's wrong. It's only that uh, I didn't understand. Uh, in fact, the people who have sold Dakaiki to the general community, like uh, basically Shibata. Shibata's papers appeared. He had three papers in, in the 80s. One, in, one or two in Biometrica, one or two in the Annals, one in the Tokyo Annals. It's he who made the sort of popular. And he says his ideas are based on Akaiki's own ideas. <coughs> But uh, what Akaiki did was uh, when, he, uh, when he saw that Schwarz had made those uh, sort of rude comments about his work, he also replied back. And this is the paradigm he said, where BIS is not appropriate, but uh, his would be. Uh, <coughs> uh, here's one interesting thing. Uh, in, in he's working in a situation which is quite common. At first sight, it seems very unusual to Bayesians, but it's quite common, that the true model is not in the set of models from which you make selections. And uh, I'm fond of quoting George Box, who has uh, said something about analysis of variance, that, uh, uh, in fact, about most statistical paradigms, or statistical analysis, that all models are false, some are useful. So, so that's the kind of question. Criterion doesn't the alpha will not depend on n. Uh, alpha will not depend on n. It will depend only on the dimension. And that's right. That's right. <coughs> that's an interesting question. <coughs> uh, 
So he said, uh, but if the model is not in a model space, you cannot use a zero one loss. All models are false. So everybody, every. So he suggested that the object of model selection is to make predictions. So if you have iid x1 to xn, you have to predict xn plus 1. If you have a regression problem with uh, x is and x beta and so on, then think of a complete replication of the data and predict the replicated observations with squared error loss. So that's the kind of prediction that he made. So that's the kind of situation where uh, he thought that his, his method would do better. Uh, there's a Bayesian justification of Akaiki given by Marvin Stone. Uh, but uh, I, Nitai and I have shown that, that in that context, it's, it's sort of similar to the context uh, where you look at uh, this work that I'm not talking about today, Berger and Perichin, O'Hagan and so on. One can show that Akaiki is not a natural thing to use. So I, but uh, this, uh, this remark that you see here is uh, sort of left over from a different talk. So anyway, so, so all I'm saying is there is a Bayesian justification. But in that context, one can show that Akaiki is not an appropriate thing to do. So I'll ignore that. Also, uh, sometimes Jun Shao, this confusion that I'm talking about, of which to use when, uh, translates to Jun Shao also. So, and, and nearly everyone. So, when you look at any one of these, Akaiki or BIC, you also look at the other one and compare them, even though they're obviously meant for different situations. In one case, you know the models, they're all in a model space, you have a zero one loss. People describe that as hard science. You know, you are looking at Newton's theory of gravitation or Einstein's theory of gravitation. Only one can be right, and nothing else. Or, but in most other cases, special integration problems, you don't care about the models. They have no scientific, special scientific intuition behind them. You only want to make predictions, Nancy's, and so on. So that's where Akaiki. But people usually compare these both. And Jun Shao does have theorems showing that in many cases, BIC did as well but under additional assumptions. In the situations where Akaikika does well, BIC might do well also, but under more assumptions. Uh, but I would regard those as sort of uh, six, six. Einstein versus uh, Newton. Uh, Jeffrey would say there's an infinite number of models. That's right. Not just two. Yeah, Isn't so, that so right? that's right. So uh, I, I simplified that, but there's also what's, what used to be a status quo when, uh, just before Einstein introduced his uh, new theory of gravitation, uh, there were others who thought that by making adjustments to, for example, the gravitational constant, you can fix the deviations from Newton's theory. So what Professor Zellner is saying that in that case, the status quo would be like mu belongs to R, whereas Einstein would be mu equal to a particular number, these two models. Newton would be another mu equal to one particular number. But there are an infinite number of models. As right. you know, people uh, were making adjustments to Newton's laws right, before right. Einstein came up. Right. Uh, uh, if, if it were only an adjustment of the gravitational context, then I'd regard that as one model, because I just say it's a model which says that gravitational constant is a number between 0 to infinity. Uh, but, uh, but if these are different adjustments, each of these is a different model. But still, you feel that uh, at least in the case of Einstein, you know, he is on record as saying that pe when people told him that his theory had been verified, he said, I didn't need a verification. He knew. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he did believe strongly in something being true or false. Scientists do believe in true or false. They are not just making predictions. <clears throat> so uh, what am I? saying okay, okay so so all I'm saying is that uh, in most of the literature you see these being compared all the time uh, for example uh, this paper of Junsha which uh, I like very much because I gathered my intuition from there uh, it shows uh, it, all the theorems are proved for the prediction loss but then when he does simulations he refers to the zero one loss it's very odd here's uh, what the base rule would be it's, um, 
an elementary exercise. So suppose you had these K models, and still I'm thinking of the simple situation, uh, IID, so you want to predict only Xn plus 1. Then uh, when I write X1 to Xn Mi, I mean uh, I've integrated out the parameters under the model Mi. So I've got a single number psi i, which depends on the data, x1 to xn, but nothing else is uh, there. So no hidden parameter and so on. So I if the model Mi were true, uh, then you would have used uh, the predictor psi i. Since you do not know uh, that this model is true, what you do is this model average psi bar, where you weight with the uh, posterior probability of model Mi the kind of thing that I showed you when you comp computed base factors. Now, and, and then the base rule is to choose the model which is closest to, for which the psi i is closest to psi bar. So you compute psi bar and then choose uh, psi i which is closest to psi bar. One can show that this is the base rule. It's, it's not hard to show. <coughs> Against what kind of loss? Big pardon? Against what kind of loss? Uh, this square error for xn plus 1. So you have to come up with a number depending on x1 to xn and uh, you evaluate by taking squared error, uh, posterior expectation of the squared error. <coughs> uh, in the case of my toy example, the normal, this says that uh, you should choose the second model provided the posterior probability of m2 given x1 to xn is greater than half. So it's again, in this particular case, it's the same rule as the rule for the zero one loss, like the base factor. Uh, many Bayesians say that uh, you should not do a model selection at all, just use psi bar. And I stop the first time that this exceeds half, this sum. I'm moving from the simplest to the most complex, so j equal to one is the simplest model, j equal to two is the next most complex model, j equal to i is the ith most complex model, and I sort of accumulate my posterior probability, the first time is bigger than half. That's the i to choose. <coughs> and they show that under prediction loss, under certain assumptions, uh, that's uh, the Bayes rule. What would have been uh, the rule for zero one loss? So that's, the post that's what they call a posterior median model. Uh, for zero one loss, you would have chosen the one with the maximum posterior probability. That's the posterior mode. Uh, when they first had this, Jim uh, thought that uh, this would take us towards uh, Akaiki because it chooses a more less complex model than the mode most, in most cases. It turns out, at least in the nested cases, there's not much to distinguish between the two because what happens for even moderate size sample size is the posterior mode gets nearly all the probabilities. So the posterior median and mode are very close. So it doesn't solve that problem about Akaiki. So, so one is a posterior mode for zero one loss. Uh, for prediction, is uh, uh, posterior median. Uh, Jim and Barbieri have a version for uh, one of the most important uh, non-nested cases where you have all subsets regression. There's a version of that in that case also, uh, but again under certain assumptions. I had a list of examples for a talk that I gave in Calcutta, but uh, uh, here's. Uh, Here's some taken from those. So uh, before I pass on, what I'm going to do now is to show you a few examples and then begin with Jun Shao and then uh, we'll do something that's new. So here's a toy example of a non-nested case. Uh, we often assume that uh, the Xi's are normal, but everybody knows that they, it's not easy to distinguish between a normal and a Cauchy for, from a finite amount of data. So you might want to sort of test whether it's a normal or a Cauchy. That's an example of a non-nested model. Uh, we had, uh, uh, in many, many years ago, when model selection was not yet popular, I had looked at such problems in the 1970s. Here's a problem that uh, I was talking about, and I'll, uh, when you get to Jun Shao, that's the example that he discusses in detail. That's the standard regression model. <coughs> and. Uh, in this framework, a model corresponds to the variables that you keep in the regression equation. <coughs> and I'm told that uh, 
uh, SAS has an output which is sort of related to AIC. Uh, it's, the, it's, uh, it's the CP criterion of Colin Mallows, which is known to uh, be related to AIC at least asymptotically. <coughs> and there have been some recent work on those also. So that's a, two examples. <coughs> uh, but uh, today I'm only talking about nested cases, and one of the important nested cases is polynomial regression. And at the very end, I'll come back to this uh, polynomial regression. Uh, Shibata's examples were in, included, poly, uh, Shibata was looking at the nested case. And uh, polynomial regression is one of those. And there's a natural degree of complexity. Higher the degree of the polynomial, the more complex the model. So each degree determines the model. Uh, and so you see that uh, this reference to Shibata, that uh, <coughs> he showed that uh, in certain situations, certain scenarios, the best way of choosing the degree uh, from the prediction loss of point, point of view is due to, uh, is to use Akaiki's rule. But these best are based on optimal are from an asymptotic frequentist point of view. Uh, here's an example on which uh, I worked, uh, but uh, here it's not so important to have AIC, well, well AIC is not so important. Uh, we had been looking, working with the geologist, so what they have, they go to the field, collect data, and then they draw maps. So they say, they have to draw maps means they say, this is one homogeneous region, this is another homogeneous region, draw boundaries. And that you can do by model selections in an automatic way. Uh, one of the difficulties there is that some of these are non-nested. And there, what I'm going to tell today will not apply. You have to use uh, these things I'm not talking of today, uh, things that Berger, Perici, O'Hagan have done. <coughs> uh, there's another problem which I find interesting, but it's probably not here, but I might uh, uh, quickly, uh, I think it would be too much, but I, I avoid that. Okay, so uh, what I'll do is to <coughs> begin, uh, go back to the linear model, the regressions. So you see that uh, the, the page numbers have changed. It's probably taken from another talk. What I'm going to do today, so that's the overview. I have not told you how, I've given you Akai, Akaiki's paradigm, but I have not tried to motivate Akaiki. I, I mean, I, that requires more, more work. And uh, what I'm going to do, do now is to talk about Jun Shao, what Jun Shao has done. So at least begin that before we take a break. <coughs> so it's the same as the regression model, but sort of written in a slightly different form. Uh, these mu y's are those x betas. Mu's are the x betas. And e i is an error. Uh, in, uh, in my talk today, the error would be normal with mean 0 and sigma square, variance sigma square, because otherwise it's difficult to calculate likelihoods, do Bayesian computations. But Jun Shao himself has weaker assumptions. He doesn't assume normality. Only uh, a scale family with zero mean and uh, enough moments. And uh, he, uh, he, he doesn't assume it's an nested case, so he just takes uh, an index alpha, which might be a vector of indices, which identifies a model. In this case, alpha would be those indices which you keep in the model. So mu lies in a linear subspace, so which subspace would be identified by alpha. I just introduced his notion of optimality. This takes a little time to absorb and before I give you his theorems, and then we'll take a break. Uh, what I have up here, or what I've shown you earlier, Akaiki's uh, sort of background or paradigm for his criterion that here again, the true model need not belong to the models available to the statistician. The dimensions of model may change with n. And in fact, uh, most of the optimal theorems which Shibata, not most, all of them, had uh, the p going to infinity, that kind of asymptotics. They are much more difficult than n going to infinity. That's why he's tackling alpha. 
The angle to infinity with a fixed p is very standard. We all know how to do that. p going to infinity is still very hard. <coughs> so I'm trying to tell you, uh, get to his notion of optimality. Uh, it's sort of uh, not written the best way. So let me hide things from you a bit. Uh, I said uh, the loss is a prediction loss. It's easy to show that uh, the prediction loss minus what I've written up there, the squared error. So mu n tilde is the vector of unknown parameters, and mu hat n alpha is the estimates you're going to use. Uh, in Jun Shao, they, they are the least squares estimates, which are also the base estimates for an improper prior, the standard improper prior in regression problems, namely the uniform distribution. So that's the usual squared error, not the prediction squared error. But uh, it's well known from the time of Akaiki that the difference between Akaiki's prediction loss, that means uh, in this case Akaiki's prediction loss would be to estimate xn plus 1, xn plus 2 to x2n. Because, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, uh, sorry, why y, uh, n plus 1, y n plus 2 to y2n, so that you have full replicate of the given data. Then one can show that uh, the difference between those two losses does not depend on alpha. So if you work with one or the other, it does not matter. Optimality does not depend. That's like a, a big constant. That's, going to, that's how it's going to be. So it just reduces to the constant. In fact, Akaki probably realized this, that this leads to certain simplifications. Uh, they, uh, they divide by n, so that's something like a par observation loss. We have y1 to yn, so it's like a part of or mu n. So that's only a kind of norming. It has no significant division by n. So we are working with now a usual squared error loss. And I just remarked that that's equivalent to predictions. What is an optimality? Oh, OK, so some, some more stuff before we get there. <coughs> what Jun Shao does is to confined to the following rules, what are called the penalized likelihood rules. Sn alpha is uh, a multiple of the, uh, I think it's, um, if you take minus half of Sn alpha, that's the log maximized likelihood. Minus half of these is the log maximi maximized likelihood for a normal. We have a normal error. Lambda n is a penalty. Lambda n is a penalty. Sigma hat n squared is some estimate of sigma squared. P n alpha is the dimension associated with the model alpha. And n, there's an n here, so there's an n here. But if you ignore the n's, it's exactly what I had written down earlier for, for the normal, except that the signs have been changed. With a minus there, minus half there, that would be the log maximized likelihood. Minus half of these would be the penalty I had written there. Since I, so since everything now occurs with a minus, the object this time is to minimize these quantities for different alpha rather than maximize. So the penalized like these penalized criterions choose the model for which this quantity is a minimum. So Jun Shao looks only at such rules. <coughs> and within this is trying to show that uh, Akaiki has a sort of distinguished role. Uh, in, in this case, because there's multiplication by half, uh, multiplication by two, lambda n equals to two becomes akaiki, and lam lambda n equal to log n uh, for IIDs is BIC. For IIDs, uh, uh, we'll, usually <coughs> everybody says lambda n equal to log n for is the BIC, but that's not right. We'll come back to this later. You know, the proof that I had shown, for you, shown you for BIC was uh, for IID. In the regression case, that proof doesn't work. I, I mean, you, you, if the proof works, but gives you different numbers. So here's the last thing before we take a break. 
here's the definition of optimality. Uh, it'll take a little while, so let's first uh, get familiar with these notations. Uh, alpha and L is a model index uh, which uh, minimizes L and alpha for all alpha. No statistician can know alpha and L because, because it involves mu n and you don't know mu n. So that's why I call it an oracle. Only somebody who has uh, superhuman powers would be able to get alpha and L. But if he had the super and superhuman powers, then that's the model to choose. That's, that's our loss. So if you knew me when, the right alpha to choose would be alpha and L. It's minimizing these. <coughs> uh, it need not be the true model because we'll see that uh, in examples. It need not be the true model. It's minimizing the prediction loss. It need not be the true model. But it is the best model to choose with, for this particular loss function. For the prediction loss, that's the best model to choose if you had superhuman powers. If, for example, you were a prophet with uh, direct communication to the superhuman powers. Well, uh, no model selection can do better than the Oracle Alpha and L, and that sets the goal. Can you asymptotically do as well as Alpha and L? If you can, that's an optimal optimal thing to do. And one of the theorem that I'll sort of show you when we come back is Akaiki does that. So we'll take a break now. Or, okay. Okay. Yes.